Hey folks, Weingart here. This show has been a long time in coming. I've been working on the actual checklist you're about to see for months, and the things that have gone into it have been years in the making. And uh, it's finally here. It's the MCRIT Call Response Intubation Checklist Show. And uh, at least I am very excited. So let's get right to it. This is a screencast. If you're listening to this on audio, I think you'll get most of the vital stuff, but uh, you're probably better off just waiting until you get to something some device that allows you to watch video because uh, we're going to be going through this checklist and how to use it and I think it's good to be able to see it in real time. So here's the front page of the checklist and what you'll see is uh, you got a top really uh, easily organized space with some white space in there and then you have a very cluttered bottom portion. I'm going to teach you how to use this in just a sec and it's supposed to be printed double sided. So when you turn what you should see is this. Uh, which is even more densely packed and filled with good stuff, and you should never actually have to look at this in a real clinical situation. Now, the way this is to be used is you print it out, and preferably you have it printed out uh, ahead of time. You don't need to do this in real time during an intubation. You just have these sit in somewhere, or uh, you just have the top portion I'm going to show you, but you have this already printed out, and it's double sided. All you do is you fold it in half. There's a nice little dotted line there showing you uh, where to fold it, and then you're left with this, which is the only portion you should be really using during the checklist uh, portion of this. Uh, so it's a call and response checklist, meaning that one person uh, in the preparations for intubation should be asking each of these questions out loud, and then someone else, uh, or multiple someone, should be saying, yes, uh, or we have that, or nope, I'm making, I'm making that happen right now. But uh, call and response is the most effective way to make this happen. If you're alone, these checklists don't work as well. You kind of uh, cognitively jump over things, unless there's like an automated voice saying the thing out loud and then you respond to it. But I don't think you have the technology to make that happen yet. So call and response, and we're gonna go through each one of these items because there's some little uh, peculiarities and uh, some things need a little bit further explication, but I think if you hear it once, then uh, you're golden from this point on. And that cluttered back portion, that's the explanation for all the things on this checklist that you should only need to refer to once or when you hand it to a medical student so they understand what you're doing, they could follow along on back. So that's what that's there for. It's never meant to be consulted in a clinical situation in real time. So let's get right to it. So let's start off looking at the plan. So the first question the plan section asks is, and all these have question marks on the end when you think about them in your head, but uh, I was told it became too cluttered to see all those question marks. So we just have it as an implied thing that these are questions. So are there any hop killers? Now I did a show on the hop killers. The hop killers are hemodynamic kills, oxygenation kills, and pH kills. And what you should be doing is asking yourself, are any of these three going on? with the patient in front of you because this is what's going to cause them to box in the peri-intubation. And so hemodynamics, is the patient already hypotensive or with poor cardiac output or do they have the potential to have that happen uh, during the intubation? You're switching them from negative to positive pressure. You're taking away their sympathetic surge. Uh, are they going to bottom out on you? And if you think they will, then you need to do a hemodynamically safe intubation. And that lecture will be up on the site soon because I have to give it a smack first. With SMAC, of course, being social media and critical care, the best critical care conference ever, Sydney, Australia, March 2013, come. Um, so that lecture will be up soon. The oxygenation lecture uh, is the entire MCRIT site and the article I wrote with Lich Levitan. And then PH Kills, is, I think was podcast number two, but I'm going to link to every, every, this is like going to be the biggest set of show notes in the universe is going to be for this post because everything on here is going to be linked. So how to intubate the patient uh, with a metabolic acidosis, so you do not steal their compensation and cause them to code from dysrhythmia, uh, will be in the show notes. So consider these three. This is what patients are dying from in the peri-intubation, and if they have any potential for any of these three to kill them, do something special. All right, the next line of the plan, again, asks you to consider your strategy for actually getting a tube into this patient. Should you do RSI, rapid sequence intubation? Or should you do it awake? And that's going to be predicated on whether you think this is a difficult intubation or not. And if you do think it's difficult, will the patient give you between 5 and 10 minutes to prep them for an awake intubation? 
Uh, now, you notice nowhere on here is the predictors of a difficult airway because they don't work. And the things that you can figure out, like uh, making sure the patient's capable of being put in the proper position, is built into the checklist. The only other thing I do routinely, and I probably should add this somewhere, is uh, have the patient open their mouth, look at their dentition, look if there's any loose teeth, look if there's dentures, look how used their tongue is. So I'm going to add that somewhere uh, in terms of airway assessment, opening the mouth. And this, this whole checklist is going to be constantly in a state of flux. I imagine after this show, there's going to be a ton of comments about other things that you want changed. So I'm going to just release the next iteration. And, uh, and I hate to keep pausing with these asides. I apologize. But I've been asked, well, you know, this is great, but it's not really perfectly applicable to my shop. I want to be able to customize it a little. I'm going to figure out ways to make this customizable for anyone. So I'm, I'm brainstorming it. It might involve photocopying and cutting out little pieces of paper to paste over it to make your ideal sheet. But if you do that once, then you're pretty much set for that point on. Okay, so RSI versus awake. Should you do this DSI? DSI, of course, delayed sequence intubation. Uh, if you don't know that, you haven't been listening to MCRIT at all ever because uh, you know DSI. And DSI patients are the ones who are not tolerating pre -oxygenation. They're delirious. They're fighting you. And so you will induce them, quote unquote, with ketamine, do what you need to do, and only then paralyze them. RSA, rapid sequence airway, a concept from my friend Darren Brody down in New Mexico, and it's the idea that if you have a patient you need to definitely bag during that apneic period, like that low pH intubation, should you just give your meds, immediately place a supraglottic airway, bag the patient, and then when you're ready to intubate, take out the airway and intubate. And that way you're not causing gastric insufflation. And then the last one on this line, is it an ICP slash vascular intubation? What does this mean? It means you have a patient with like a subarachnoid or some other cause of high ICP and a high blood pressure, and you worry during the sympathetic surge of intubation, they're going to spike that blood pressure even higher and potentially increase their intracranial pressure. Or, same situation in terms of the way you handle it, would be a patient with an aortic dissection who you know any spike in BP could cause that bad boy to rupture, and you don't want any spike in BP at all. Both of these are done the same way. They're done with pretreatment meds and a very careful, meticulous approach, which I will discuss on an upcoming podcast. All righty, next on the list is... Uh, you call out now so it can be prepared, your choice of induction agent and muscle relaxant. Now on the sheet on the bottom is a list of intubation meds. Their doses, the doses for a normotensive 70 kilogram patient and the doses for a hypotensive patient. Now you might look at those hypotensive doses and have some questions. This doesn't make much sense. Another lecture I'm giving at SMAC, which will go up on the MCRIT site, that will explain all of this as to why I made those choices for the hypotensive patients. But I think you'll find the other two columns makes total sense. It's probably been your practice, but now you have a quick and easy reminder as to those doses. Okay, so you have your meds ready. Now, if you have, the patient has any potential to drop their blood pressure, during the peri-intubation, then consider mixing up some push-dose pressors. Now, I had a debate with Amal Matu, which is going to go up on MRAP, about push-dose pressors. If you are an uh, MRAP subscriber, look forward to that. But his uh, one of the things he raised is, well, now I'm going to have an extra syringe sitting on the counter next to my intubation meds. I might confuse it. Now, you better have your syringes labeled really well, because if you're confusing meds, that's a bigger problem than push-dose pressors. But if this really is an issue in your mind, then have the nurse put this in their pocket and that it's there, ready to go if you need it, and it's not going to be confused with your rock aeronium. Mixing instructions are there, but the mixing instructions are there only for push-dose epi. Now, why is this? That is my preferred peri-intubation push-dose presser, because not only will it raise the blood pressure, it'll actually increase cardiac output as well, and therefore make it more likely that your induction and sedative, ed sedative agents get to the patient at the time you expect them to which if the patient has a depressed cardiac output, won't happen. So push-dose epi is there. If you want to use push-dose phenylephrine, that's up to you, but I'm not putting it on the sheet. You have other access to push-dose pressors if you need to know how to mix up phenylephrine, and I will put that in the show notes as well. All right, the failed airway plan is verbalized. Not just you have one in your head somewhere deep in your subconscious. You have a plan, and then the team actually says it out loud and you all discuss it, and you all know exactly what's going to happen at each stage of failed airway so that it's not a surprise when the failed airway actually happens. And you go a step further, and you don't just say, uh, we'll do one intubation attempt, and then we'll try a second one. Uh, you will say, who will try that second one? 
and you'll say what's going to differ between the two intubation attempts. And if the third one has to happen, that really should be an attending, so we'll verbalize that. And if you want to know which failed airway plan I'm verbalizing, well, it's that shock trauma uh, failed airway algorithm I did a blog post about just a couple days ago, and I'll link to that as well. But that's the easiest plan to verbalize for me. It's we'll try intubating three times, changing something between each of those times. If the patient desaturates to 93%, we bag them back up. If we can't get in three intubations, we do a supraglottic airway. If that temporizes, great. If it doesn't, we perform a surgical cricothyrotomy. Next up is the Cricon evaluation, the cricothyrotomy um, concept of readiness level depending on the patient. And if you look below the fold, you got your little Cricon box. It's an abbreviated Cricon. I didn't put Cricon 1 or 2 here because for the purposes of this, in the preparation phase, the question you have to ask yourself is, um, I don't think this is particularly a difficult airway. Patient looks okay. Well, then you're always Cricon 5, which means for every single patient, you discuss the fact that a surgical cricothyrotomy might happen and who's going to perform it. You feel the cricothyroid membrane and the thyroid and cricoid cartilage, and you make sure your kit is either at the bedside or visible to you in that you already know where it is, that it exists, that it hasn't been touched, moved, etc. for each airway. That's every patient. That's Cricon 5. Cricon 4 is a patient who is a predicted difficult airway, but they're stable. They're satting okay. Um, for those patients, you mark out the cricothyroid membrane, and the kid is at the bedside. And you consider bringing the ultrasound around if you're having any trouble figuring out where the membrane is and ultrasounding them now in the preparatory phases and marking that membrane. That's Cricon 4. Cricon 3 is a patient who is hypoxemic and predicted difficult. These patients, you're going to try one attempt at intubation, uh, and if their sat falls, you're going to progress right to surgical cricothyrotomy if they are unable to be successfully intubated or had a supraglottic airway placed. And for those patients, before you get to that point, you inject them, you prep the neck with betadine or chlorhexidine, you open your kit, and someone who's going to be performing the cricothyrotomy already has the scalpel in hand. That is Cricon 3. And then, last one on the plan, you plan and ask for the preparation of your post-intubation sedation meds now. Not after the patient's intubated, especially if you use ROC. Now, right up front, before you're doing all the rest of the checklist, you say, here's what I want for post-intubation sedation. Could you get these prepped now? And so there's a list here, and you could disagree with this list. This might be something you uh, customize yourself, but here's my list, it's there. Uh, either a fentanyl drip or dilaudid pushes. I should say hydromorphone. I shouldn't be using brand names. Uh, and so that's your uh, analgesia and a sedation type med. And that is secondary. And that'll either be propofol, midazolam, or ketamine. That was the plan. Next up, we move to the patient prep box. And the first one on there is denitrogenation. And I separate that out from oxygenation because they're two separate concepts. And this is super important to understand. You could have a patient satting 97% and you're deciding you're going to intubate them. So you put on the non-rebreather mask and all of a sudden they're satting 100%. Well, that patient's now oxygenated, but they are not denitrogenated. Those are two entirely separate concepts. And the converse is you could have a patient who's satting uh, 85% and you put them on a non-rebreather for six minutes and they are still satting 85%. Well, that patient's denitrogenated. They've replaced all the possible nitrogen in their lungs with oxygen, but they are not oxygenated because that is not a safe patient to start your intubation. So they are two separate concepts. We often think about them the same under the rubric of pre-oxygenation, but they are not the same and they get screwed up because the most common screw up I see is that they... People forget about the non-rebreather until two seconds before they're ready to tube. They put the non-rebreather on, they look up at the SAT, it's 100, and they feel good about themselves. You have not given yourself any buffer of oxygen in the lungs, any reservoir in the FRC to actually be able to safely intubate this patient. So they have to be broken up in your mind, and you have to do things differently. In order to check off the we denitrogenated box, the patient either needs eight vital capacity breaths on a non-rebreather set to as high as your flow um, valve will go. So not a 15 open it until it sounds like a jet engine, which will be 30 or 40 liters per minute, and let them breathe eight vital capacity breaths, which means the biggest breaths they could take, or three minutes. That is when you could check off this box in your head and say, yes, they've denitrogenated. Then the oxygenation is, I want to see this patient greater than 95%. 
greater than 95%. If they're not, I want to consider CPAP. So that's you know positive pressure preoxygenation with non-invasive or a BVM with a PEEP valve. Or if they're not tolerating that, DSI, CPAP. Until I could get them up to 95% or I've hit 15 of CPAP and then I'll give up and say I can't get them any better. That's why we've broken those two up. Then positioning. Positioning is key. If you want to know why you fail and then anesthesia comes down and gets in on the first try, it's because they care about positioning. They knew even though the intubation was critical that taking the time to properly position is worth it, that it's the only way to safely intubate a patient. I am of the Rich Levitan school, so my positioning is the face plane parallel to the ceiling and the head um, bolstered with sheets or some kind of padding to actually get the ear holes, the external auditory meatus, at the same horizontal plane as the sternal notch. So face parallel to the ceiling, ears to sternal notch. The patient's head of the bed should be 30 degrees head up, so the head higher than the feet, because this helps with both preoxygenation and glottic exposure. If they're in a collar, obviously you can't do this head positioning, in which case you put them in reverse Trendelenburg, and you have to have a plan for who is going to take the collar off and take inline stabilization. You cannot intubate a patient in a collar. You cannot intubate a patient in a collar unless you are doing a fiber optic bronch through their nose. You can't intubate a patient in a collar because their mandible won't move. The collar must come off, so you must have a plan for that happening, and this is the time to discuss it. Next up are monitors. They have a BP cuff on, they have their EKG leads reading, and they have a pulse ox, and it's a reliable pulse ox, and it's giving you a good waveform. And, and here's the real key, it should be visible to the intubator and whoever's overseeing the intubation. Both of those guys should be able to see it. And that means you might want a slave monitor facing the foot of the bed, uh, or you might want to have a separate pulse ox, uh, one of those standalone ones that you've hooked up to another of the patient's fingers. Now you have one on the big monitor and a separate one that you could see. Or you assign someone to be the pulse ox watcher. And their only job is to call out when the patient hits 93%. That's all they really need to do. I don't want to hear, oh, SAT 797, SAT's 96, because that's cognitive flutter. I, you know, that's cognitive clutter. I don't want that. What I want is the SAT has now hit 93. You must re this patient. That's what I want to hear. And so assign someone to do that. Next, reliable access, which means one great IV or preferably two great IVs, but I'll take one if I had to, that I've now tested beforehand and made sure it's not going to blow during the intubation attempt. If I have any doubt or if I'm having any trouble, I just place an IO. It's not even a, a thought on my mind anymore. I just pop in the IO because I know that's going to work, and then I could deal with placing a central line after the patient's safely intubated, sedated, and pain controlled. Nasal prongs for apneic oxygenation. They should be placed now. If you want to turn them on like Rich does, that's great. If you have enough oxygen ports, if you don't, then you can do it later. Um, but you need to either need to turn them on now or have a plan for who's going to turn them on later. Because the way this works is most ED bays only have two oxygen ports, which means one of them should have a BVM and one of them should have your non-breather for pre-oxygenation. And what I do is I push the meds and then I assign someone to actually switch out the non-rebreather for the nasal cannula and I put it on 15 liters. And that way, if I forget, the worst that happens is they don't get the benefits of apneic oxygenation, but I don't wind up not having my BVM hooked up to oxygen, which is life-threatening. If you want to be really clever, you just grab an oxygen tank, put your nasal cannula on it, turn it to 15, and put it underneath the patient's non-rebreather mask, and then you don't have to do anything in the peri-intubation. You're good to go. But those nasal prongs should be there for every intubation because it's going to prolong the time till the patient desaturates. And then the last thing on patient prep is plus or minus gastric tube. If the patient's a big upper GI bleed with a belly full of blood or they're a small bowel obstruction, I like getting an NG tube in. There's no evidence for this, but I like doing it now when the patient still has airway reflex and getting all that stuff out uh, as opposed to it being a ticking time bomb during my intubation. If the patient doesn't like getting the NG tube because it's really painful and they're fighting you, then I just immediately DSI the patient. That was the patient prep. Let's move on to equipment. And the first one on the equipment list is a table. You need a table. You must have a table. You cannot do this by putting your equipment on the patient's bed. This is the dumbest idea in the world. Something will fall on the floor, and it's going to be at the worst possible moment. And then you are 
faced with that dilemma of I see the chords and I could just pass that bougie but it's touched the floor do I just risk the fact that uh, I'm going to put disgusting stuff in the patient's airway or do I lose my view you do not want this happening all your equipment goes on a big table and that way it's always there and if you use the bougie and you can't get it you put the bougie back down on the table you do not put it on the patient's chest where it will I promise you wind up on the floor. It's even worse when you have a $3,000 CMAC blade that you put on the patient's chest and that winds up on the floor. Very disappointing. Get a table. And you know, the next level of this would be all the kit dump things, the HEMS, the Helicopter Emergency Medical Services use, which is a disposable red bag with the printed outline of all the devices you want on it. And they just put that down and you can put that on your table and actually lay all the items out on top of their respective outlines. Now, I don't have that level of uh, goodness, but that would be really cool. But at the very least, you need a table. You need a BVM on auction, and that should be turned up as high as it could go. And then if there's any of those auctionation potential problems going on, you should have a peep valve hooked up to the BVM. Uh, I would say you should have a peep valve at every intubation in its package standing by. But if it's a patient who is one of those hop kills with the auctionation side, then you should have it on the BVM already. If they're required CPAP for pre-oxygenation, then you must have a PEEP valve on the BVM or you will not be able to re-oxygenate the patient. Then you have a waveform capnograph, not an easy cap, a waveform capnograph, and you put it on the BVM and you test it by blowing into the actual part where it touches the machine. You just disconnect the tubing and blow and you see a spike of CO2 at that point and then you know the machine is good so if you're not getting a waveform, it's the patient, not the machine. And so you have that between the mask and the bag of your BVM. So that if you have to reoxygenate through an LMA or through the mask, you will get immediate confirmation that those breaths are going in. Then I have on here video laryngoscope at the bedside for every intubation. I'm not saying you have to use it. I'm saying it's there. Now, if you don't have a video laryngoscope, you got to get one. I'm with men. You could still have potential intubations where DL is the better choice than VL, but I think you should have the VL backup as a failed airway plan at every intubation, which means every department should have a VL and it should be present at every intubation, not necessarily used, but present. And I use the CMAC system. You know, got you guys always know I take money from no company. I use CMAC because the blade geometry allows me to use it as a DL and then just look up at the screen if I need VL without having to change a thing. Get your intubation equipment at the bedside, out on a table, which means you have a tube, you have a stylet in there, straight to cuff, bend shape, and the stylet is bent twice, once for the straight to cuff at the bottom, and then at the top, it's bent over the top of the endotracheal tube so it cannot protrude and cause airway trauma. You have two syringes, because one always manages to get lost. You have a backup standard laryngoscope. Um, if that means you're using video, like a CMAC, you have a regular laryngoscope as well. If it means you're using a regular laryngoscope and you don't have video, it means you have a second backup laryngoscope because these fail at the worst possible moment. You have a properly sized oropharyngeal airway and you have your tube securing device already there ready to go. All right, you have your failed airway equipment at the bedside, which means whatever failed airway plan you verbalized, you have all the equipment to make it happen at the bedside which for me, since I use the shock trauma failed airway algorithm, means every bedside, every intubation has a bougie, a properly sized supraglottic airway. I use an intubating air cue because that is the uh, one that is easiest for us to intubate through with our fiber optic devices, and a scalpel. And that's all I need to perform my entire shock trauma difficult airway algorithm. I actually don't need anything else from the Cryke kit. So as long as I have a scalpel and a bougie, I am good to go. And then, last but not least, you have two suctions, and you've tested them, and you've made sure the tubing is hooked up properly. I'll do a wee on that at some point, but um, for now, you have two sets of suctions, yank hours. You've verbalized, if you have the ones, the yank hours with the hole on it that don't work unless you hold your finger, you verbalize to the intubator, you understand you must put your finger over this hole to make this work, or else they'll forget in the heat of battle. All right, so that was the equipment section, let's talk about the last part of the call response checklist, the team. All right, first one up, roles assigned for each stage of the failed airway plan. We've already discussed that. You've assigned a pulse ox watcher. In case you can't see the pulse ox yourself, 
And I would say assign a watcher anyway. You know, it could be someone else who's doing another task as well um, because you might forget. You might uh, be concentrating inside the mouth and you'd really like to hear someone say, the SAT has now hit 93%. By the same token, that same person could be the one who performs reoxygenation. They, they won't be holding the mask. That's usually the intubator up at the head of the bed. They'll be squeezing the bag. And you've discussed at this phase I need you to count out Mississippis between each breath. I need you to give a breath and then count out six Mississippi before you give another one. And you've talked about this ahead of time. And you've explained that you could kill a patient if they bag too hard or too quickly. The next role that's assigned is the role of the external laryngeal manipulator. And you teach them now. If I say I need external laryngeal manipulation, what I need you to do is put your hand on the thyroid. Let me guide your hand to wherever I need to, and then you hold your hand in that position as if you were a statue. And you teach them this now so that when you say that, they immediately know what you need and you don't have to teach them while you're looking in the mouth. Um, that same person could be the head elevator. Um, we're already at ears to stone latch. If you're having any trouble visualizing, what you should do is take your right hand, put it underneath the patient's occipit, and actually continue to flex the head towards the body, and that will improve your glottic exposure. If you now see the cords, what you want is that same person you've taught uh, external laryngeal manipulation to take their hand and hold the head in that same position. And then the last thing on the list, the last thing on the checklist in, as a total, is, is the entire team in personal protective equipment, uh, which for me means at the minimum that they're wearing eye protection and preferably if they're going to be open in their mouth at all, that they're wearing a surgical mask as well. And that is the MCRIT checklist that you will be doing for every intubation if you buy into this stuff. Now there's more to the list, and let's look at that. The bottom portion has all sorts of fun stuff here. You have awake intubation and how to get it done. Uh, there's a podcast for that that I'll link to in the show notes. You have the pre-treatment meds for both uh, high ICP or hemodynamically unstable intubations. Uh, we already said you have your actual sedative and muscle relaxants. You have the Crycon level. You have push dose epi there how to mix it up. You have the contraindications for succinylcholine. You have your initial vent settings. You have your uh, initial post-intubation antigol uh, sedation. You have how to perform a low pH tube. And you have, and this is for us, how to use the air cues. Well, you could replace that with whatever you like, depending on what superglottic airway you use. And then if you need more intubation, uh, more information rather, uh, there's the mcrit.org slash airway link, and there's a QR code that'll take you right to it. So that's the front of the checklist. You won't be seeing this portion. This will be folded over, but it'll be there for your preparation in case you need to uh, remind yourself of anything. The back of the checklist is a lot of the stuff we just talked about, breaks it all down, explains it. And this is so you can hand it to an intern or a medical student and have them uh, be able to understand what you're really doing with all this stuff. So that's there for you, sitting there. Uh, but really... After you use this for a while, you'll never be looking at that portion. It's for really uh, junior learners. This out, it comes with a set of instructions, and it says just what I told you up front, which is you print them out double-sided, you fold the top, and that's what you use for the actual intubation. All right, so I think we're at the uh, end of this. This went long, but I knew it would because there's a lot to cover. So that's the MCRIT call and response intubation checklist. I want to hear your comments. I want to hear any improvements. I want to hear things you disagree with. Put them in the comments. The other thing is that you might have noticed that the Google Plus page for MCRIT is not being used, which being used is the MCRIT community page. I'm going to put a we about that, explaining that all, so you can understand what that really means. That's all I got for today, folks. This has been fun. Scott Weingart for the MCRIT podcast saying bye-bye. <laughs>